Uh, good morning. Uh, I feel a little bit intimidated because <laughs> most of my friends are sitting here right on the front row <laughs> staring at me and smiling as if they know exactly what I'm going to say. Uh, we are going to talk about a very important issue, as many of you, all of you know. Our country is going through an epidemic now of opioid crisis where we're losing uh, in the neighborhood of uh, 90 to 100 young people a day for deaths, for opioid overdose. Uh, it's a worldwide epidemic in the sense that other people are experiencing it too in other countries. But we, for some reason, have got it concentrated in our own country. And uh, it's a serious matter that Honestly, we don't have a good idea about why this is happening at, at such an extraordinary rate. Uh, I gave a talk yesterday at MBA to 750 young men staring me at the theater, and I'm telling you, the thought that any of those young men who are the cream of our whole nation's uh, crop of young people would get into a situation where things were so desperate and these drugs would uh, take them to the, such a state that they would kill themselves. And I'm not talking about kill themselves one uh, here and there. I'm talking about three in a town or three in a, three in a uh, four uh, here and there. And as I said, I'm trying my, set, my best to understand what's going on in the context of what I've learned as a, a physician. I'm an internist, as many of you know. and. Uh, I uh, was not trained in addiction. Vanderbilt and none of the other high-level institutions of learning for medical students had more than a token course on it. Didn't know a thing about it. And uh, it happened that uh, I got a call from the dean, acting dean, he said, Andy, get up here. I was at the clinic seeing patients. Get up here quick. So I dropped everything and went up to his office. And there he was in a state of frustration because one of the senior faculty members in our school had jumped in bed with one of his own patients. She was drunk, he was drunk, and the husband caught them. The husband was going to the papers. And uh, the husband said, if you'll get somebody to take care of this guy, I know my wife's sick, but you take care of this guy, I will not go to the papers. And the dean's eyes turn right at me and says, you elected. <laughs> and you take uh, so-and-so down to your office and see that this doesn't happen again. That, that was my first introduction to addiction training at Vanderbilt <laughs> Medical School. So I went down with this guy to my office, and uh, he said, oh, Andy, I'm not going to do this again. I, I made a mistake, da, da, da. I don't drink. You know, I don't, you know, it's, it's okay. And I said, well, do you, have you been to treatment? He said, no, I don't need treatment. I, 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 I had to go to AA every now and then. And uh, I said, okay, well, now you come back next week, the typical get another uh, appointment out there and come on back and we'll work, work this out. Well, <clears throat> I thought that was enough. Well, it turns out that he went out to San Diego. He was very, very prominent in our medical school. Many of you know who I'm talking about. And he went out on the beach in San Diego after giving a very prestigious talk to his colleagues, had a 38 and put it in his mouth and blew his head off. I became an addictionologist that moment when I know, knew that what had happened to him, I had no idea about what it was. I had not been trained. Nobody told me a thing about it. And I decided that I was going to get trained and I was going to bring back to Vanderbilt the things that I had missed and they needed to know. <coughs> So I went to St. Mary's, Minneapolis, Minnesota for rehab training and became uh, part of a group. I learned about group process. I learned about the family program. We eventually had one of the senior uh, faculty uh, people there at St. Mary's to come and be our senior 
treatment per person at uh, the Vanderbilt Institute of Treatment of Addiction. And from that moment on, Vanderbilt has been the leader or a leader in the, the, the change of focus now from no training to 80% of our medical schools in the country, from 8% when I started, uh, have a very intense program of, uh, of a recovery. I was just at a meeting uh, over the Christmas holidays or close to it, and I went to Boston where we had our meeting, and they had four of the uh, beds in the intensive care unit devoted to opioid addiction and heroin injections with dirty needles and infections of the heart. They had four of the intensive care unit beds devoted to this topic. They have to have five patient care persons, nurses, doctors, to take care of one person. So when you read in the paper that the uh, hospitals are over stressed, it's because of what we're talking about. Because our emergency rooms are just filled with these people that want opioids for continuing their addiction. So I founded the Vanderbilt Institute for Treatment of Addiction and for five years uh, we brought in patients. Many of you <coughs> may have sent uh, friends or maybe even family members. And we uh, uh, wrote Dying for a Drink from that experience. And that became a very, very uh, prominent uh, book because it was the book that told the story to primarily to the uh, church community. I had a vision that the church community, because there's a very heavy uh, spiritual angle to this whole business, spirituality is crucial to recovery, it's the basis of the 12 steps, and uh, Al-Anon, you know, Nardon for the families, uh, the 12 steps beyond anything is, if it's done right, is the most effective part of recovery that person can do. And we have, right around here, we've got more recovery 12-step uh, programs than you can shake a stick at. And we've got absolutely some of the best people in this town and, uh, that, that are involved in this. So I then uh, convinced Barbara Thompson, who is the writer of the books with me, she, we've been working on this since 1984, to come on and let's do this book, Barbara, uh, get, get Dying for a Drink out there. So we got Dying for a Drink uh, that did tell the basic th themes for families that needed to know what alcohol and drug addiction was. And she is have all the credit for the writing of books because uh, when I gave her my first manuscript of trying to to uh, get started with writing, she looked at it and uh, overnight called me back and said, Andy, it needs a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> from that day on, I've decided I'm not going to write. Barbara and I are going to write together. <laughs> so I would uh, ensue put up with all my dealings because she would listen to me, Barbara, let's talk about this and back and forth uh, because she's in Atlanta and of course I'm in Nashville. So uh, we uh, decided after we finished dying for a drink and I retired, uh, people you know, I just don't have enough to do so write another book. I said, Barbara, we didn't finish what we needed to say. Uh, I know we said a lot, but I think we need to do more. And she said, well, what do you think we need to do? I said, well, do you have a person by chance that might be interested in letting us tell his story? She said, well, I've just got the perfect guy. His name is James B. And you'll see on the book, James B. Well. We won't use his whole name because Nar Narcotics Anonymous won't let him use his whole name on the book because it would uh, compromise his anonymity. Because our first volume of this was James B's last name. <laughs> and James B was so interested in us going ahead with the project that he paid for the total change of this book for the James B, his picture and everything, is all changed and he paid for the second. So we've got two editions that you're going to get if you buy it on Amazon, the James B. 
So James B. said, yes, I'll let you tell my story. And what I did was I would say in the second chapter, after he said this chapter, what his behavior is, I would speak about what's going on in his brain and his heart and his family and dot it all. So it became a Barbara Thompson, Andy Spicker, James B. project. We would do conference calls every Tuesday afternoon for one to two hours. We would talk about what the subject is for the next part of the book. And uh, he was in Raleigh, North Carolina. Barbara was in Atlanta, and I was in Nashville. And it took us three and a half to four, four and a half years to write this book. This book is 44 years of my experiences with addiction. And I hope you have a chance to read it. I was extremely interested in how important it seemed to be to the people in the audience yesterday at MBA. I sat down and I wrote a little notes to end the book. A woman came up to me at MBA yesterday crying. I can hardly tell you because she said, my daughter is in Boston. She's got a one-year-old baby and she's just started heroin. What, what can I do? And I mean heroin is, the reason that the kids are taking heroin is they, they get the, the oral pills out of the medicine cabinet of their grandmothers, grandfathers, and by the way, lock them up and throw any extra uh, pills away because that's where they're getting them. And then they can't pay for them because they've got to go on the street and get the, the pills. <clears throat> and they start heroin, which is injectable. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. So we did the conference calls, and uh, James uh, told his story. And it thrilled me that since it convinced me that uh, his commitment to the spiritual angle of recovery is so critically important. And you'll get the inf information about that uh, when you read the book. So <clears throat> it's a national problem, as we've just said. Every publication that you could think of is taking it on. This is an important slide. Uh, I must tell you, I don't think it's as uh, complicated as uh, the galaxies. And uh, <laughs> I, I stayed back there. I said, man, I believe I can do better than that <laughs> because I don't know about iron in my galaxy. <laughs> man, was that something. Listen to that. Uh, this is a uh, neuron going to another neuron. You can see that uh, they hook up together. They're, they're called synapses. Uh, excuse me, I forgot where I put my pointer. Uh, this is an <coughs> origin of a neuron going to another neuron. We have billions of these in our brain. And I want to try and convince you that this is a brain disease that we're talking about. These little neurons go all over and hook up with other neurons and transmit what I'm looking at you and you're hearing what I say. All of our neurons are actively working together to make sure that you hear what I say and, and, and see and I see you. The cell is at the top and the impulse flows towards the terminal. Impulses then are, go on to bind with their receptors. So th this goes to a different place in the brain and the transmission of the information goes on down through uh, the brain through this, poss this uh, way. So <clears throat> this is an important slide because it, it gets to the idea of use misuse and addiction. For us to take a drink of uh, beer or wine or whatever at a, a dinner party, that's no big deal. But then if you start down the road to addiction down here, it's the misuse part, part is where the young people are starting to misuse the drugs that are in the cabinet. And they might even stop at a party and not use any more. But if they are, uh, have a family history of, of, of addiction, their misuse is liable to head on to addiction where, like this young woman in Boston, is now involved in 
finding a place all in her vein system to inject uh, heroin. Because these pills, as I've said, were so expensive on the street that the people that are trying to get the feeling that they need in, in their uh, body for this uh, cannot uh, pay for it, so they, they get the cheaper heroin. <clears throat> so the, the spiritual problem of this poor fellow, this, this was J not James's actual picture, but this is similar to what he had, just the despair of not being able to get off this uh, treadmill that they're on. The despair is unbelievable. And this is for alcohol as well. I mean, this, what I'm saying, uh, gets to every one of the drugs except smoking. Smoking's a different thing. But I'm talking about marijuana. And by the way, marijuana was a big question in the group that I met with yesterday. Marijuana is physiologically and psychologically addictive as well. It doesn't maybe have the same stress and guilt and shame that uh, the uh, person that's on alcohol and, and opioids has, but it's close. Guilt is the major thing that these young people have, guilt about what they have done as a result of using And the guilt that, that they feel is overwhelming when you get them into treatment, and you have to help them deal with the guilt of where they've hurt people, they've stolen from their grandparents, uh, the, the medicine and the medicine cabinets, they've stolen places uh, uh, in their uh, family's home, and the shame, then the shame about who they are is part of the reason that the, uh, the uh, recovery has to have a spiritual component to give them the feeling that they're okay, but it takes a while to do that. And of course, uh, James had early childhood trauma because his uh, drinking and using early on was because he was uh, traumatized by a babysitter. And you know, he didn't tell us that until we became acquainted with him early on uh, in the, the discussion, and he told us that he, he was traumatized by a babysitter. And that's where all of his stuff started. Now, this is kind of an interesting little four-part uh, screening test called the CAGE. We use that as a way to decide whether the person is addictive or in the mute misuse category. The C is, have you ever tried to cut down on your drinking? C for cut down. A, have people annoyed you by criticism of your drinking? A for annoyed. G, have you ever felt guilty about your drinking? G for guilty. And E, have you ever taken a morning eye opener to steady your nerves to get rid of a hangover? Now, believe it or not, this is part of the screening test that we're asking physicians to do in their office if a person says they're drinking. Because any two of these that are positive is just early evidence that they are addictive uh, and not just in the misuse category. And we have the other Michigan alcoholism screening test and other things. So that the medical students now, this has become a quiz. Uh, all of our medical students can remember four things. Well, they're, they're, the teachers can't, but they can. And uh, we have, I said, others, and we have, this is for alcohol, but we have one, uh, uh, others for our drugs. Now, it's an amazing thing to me that all of the behaviors of a real true alcoholic are kind of similar. I mean, you can, you can take a person and get them, say, Cumberland Heights or Vita, where we had our program, and... <clears throat> They all have craving, that's why we named it the book. The, what, uh, it, you cannot believe, those of you who are not alcoholics, some of you probably have been, have been recovering. The recovering alcoholic or drug addict cannot, be, cannot tell you in, in, in certain terms how the craving to have that drink or have that drug is so profound. If they are truly alcoholic, they're not talking to you about what you're talking about. They're talking to you to get you off their back so they can go get a drink. 
They want to know where their last drink is uh, to be had. They, when, when I uh, stopped uh, one of the faculty members at Vanderbilt, we went into his office after he went to treatment, and behind every large volume was an empty bottle of Jack Daniels or something. I mean, just unbelievably uh, amount. Uh, that they had to have the craving uh, of that drug or that drink uh, ready at hand. And they're preoccupied with it to the point that they will do anything to get it and get you off of their back. No matter how well you have had a relationship to them before, you can have the one, most wonderful son, grandson, or whatever, or granddaughter, and they don't care what you're talking about, they are going to get that drink. And that's the body part, the brain part, that develops the craving uh, and, and the preoccupation with the substance. And this is the only disease that tells them they don't have. Now, if somebody comes into me as an intern and say, I've got a chest pain, I'm coughing up blood, take a chest x-ray, I think I may have TB. I mean, they know that part. But the denial is so profound in a person, they won't even bring the possibility up. There's not a single alcoholic that walked into my office and said, look, I'm an alcoholic, would you give me help and get me well? Nobody, they'd never say that. It's the only disease that tells them they don't have it. It's amazing. It's a, it's a block. So the tolerance increases, meaning that they drink more to get the same buzz. They, we had one guy, I remember, that would have a full case of, of Tall's beers plus a half a pint a day. And his blood alcohol would be, you know, way up in the .4 range. And he would, he would be, we had one guy drive from Memphis for our treatment center who had a blood alcohol of .4, which is four times the normal uh, for not being... Uh, drunk. They rationalize. Oh, yeah. If you were married to that woman, you'd drink too. <laughs> That's what they say. They isolate. This is where the young people isolate. When you find a kid that's isolating, that's the sign of, of trouble. They're isolating and using. Mood changes, loss of core values. The person that's got the best Records say in the school for achievement, all of a sudden their grade point average goes down. You start looking at grade point averages going down, you think marijuana, you think all these uh, different kinds of drugs. Guilt and shame I've dealt with, boredom and relapse and triggers. Triggers are the situations where they go and find that space that started them in their drinking and once they get to that space, that will trigger them into using again. Now here's the senior part of the, this is the biggest aha moment that I've had in a medical school or practice of medicine. Why don't they stop? Why don't they stop? Why don't they see what they're doing? Why don't they look at their uh, skin and see it's yellow? Why are they vomiting blood? Why are they swollen up like a, a big fat uh, pig? Why are they tending the right upper quadrant and the, you've measured their liver and it's down to the iliac crest? Why do they have pain and loss of feeling in their legs and don't realize that that stuff they're drinking, it's they can't stop. It's not that they won't stop. That's the key to this part of the lecture. And the key is the brain. The brain has what's called the reward system. And these circles that are colored in red are part of the reward system. By the way, all this is in the handout, so you don't have to keep writing it down. <coughs> the uh, dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that keeps this going in the, the brain is made in the ventral tegmental area right here. And it's distributed through the nucleus accumbens right here 
to all the rest of the parts of the, of the reward system. The amygdala contributes the emotional part of our feelings and our behavior. And the hippocampus is where we store our memories. After this lecture, I want you to be able to ask one of the members who heard me talk, how's your hippocampus today? <laughs> <laughs> the prefrontal cortex is where you make, you and I make decisions. That is the yes, no part of our brain. That means that if this person's brain is not saturated with dopamine and in the reward system, and they have not gone from misuse to addiction that we've talked about, the yes, no's will be done properly. I'll have a date, she's drunk, I could have a, a relationship with her in the back seat of the car, but I know that it's not right, my character cracks in, I didn't get into drinking, at the same, same stage, I didn't go over that line to, from misuse to addiction. I will take her home. I will take her back to the dorm. She is ready to go with me, but I know that's not right. Now, if he is drinking to the point where he's gone over the line, then you got bad trouble. And that's what we have at Vanderbilt. That's what you read on the papers every day. And we got the last person that's going to jail for the rape of that young woman. And the reason that this is done is because his, and th those three boys, go, no-go system was out of control because dopamine in the reward system had gotten them into blocking the no-go go situation. And in here, this can be over emotional loving, uh, not loving, good loving, but loving in the bad way. It can be belligerent or depression. And this is where the, probably, I don't know for sure, this is where the whole thing came apart with that young man that I was given care for. And his reason for not living was so profound because dopamine was cracking at such a high level with him on that, that uh, uh, beach in San Diego that he took a 38 and did himself in. And that's what's happening with our kids. We're talking about this at the opioid thing. That's what they're doing. They're, they're lining up and seeing other kids in the same situation with no hope out there, no job, no, no help maybe from their family, and they're, they're knocking themselves off. I'm, it's, it's incredible. Uh, but anyway, the point I'm making uh, about all of this that's good is that we can say that if you get the person out of the situation that they're in using, that these neurons that I told you the pictures of, the neurons in the hippocampus in here will start making good memories. Because now the person, if he's drunk in an addictive way, has got a hippocampus loaded with using memories. And they were sitting there, they're made with the RNA of the person's uh, biological setup, they're made with memories that are good memories or they're using memories. Now, when they quit, you say after the four months or whatever, after they quit and they go with a trigger to the place where they uh, uh, used or feel good about it, a bar or whatever, all of the memories that are using memories in the hippocampus will start roaring out, the person will start up again, and the whole reward system will get going again. You got that? Is that? Now, I'm not an expert on all this. You're talking to a guy that does not do lab work, like uh, Danny Winder. And by the way, I'm taking our book to, uh, I, they bought the book from Danny Winder's postdoc in his lab in the uh, Vanderbilt uh, research team. And all of the all the prefrontal cortex experts, all the uh, he's an expert in the uh, nucleus accumbens. All of these young people are going to tell me all that stuff that you've been talking about, and it is not right. <laughs> and, and I'll have to come back next year and say I, I, I said it wrong. Uh, this is the way to. But that's that is what we got out of the books that we wrote in the book, our book. And Barbara wrote it and explained it extremely well. 
So I would hope that uh, anything that you are not sure about, you would read the part in the book about the nucleus of Cummings and uh, the uh, hippocampus uh, and so forth, because it is well explained in the book. But honestly, there was no book that we went to. We had to get it all off of uh, uh, Google and uh, the re available research papers that are out there. Now, uh, this is kind of important about this hippocampus and the uh, uh, starting back up again. If they go at a trigger and they've got using memories in the hippocampus and they, want, they don't want to start this, but no matter what, it will start up again, that's called euphoric recall. We know that they think about using, and as they think about using and get a trigger that will match it, off they go again. We've had one uh, young woman who was 26 years uh, free of alcoholism, had been in treatment and all that. She remarried, her husband did not realize that she was an alcoholic. He took her to a bar and, when they got married and three pints, three fifths, whatever it was, she was comatose on the floor in the bar. And when she came in, we thought she had bad hepatitis, infl inflammation from a virus. But her sister came in and said, hey, Dr. Spicker, did you know that my sister is an alcoholic? And we ended up treating her for the right thing. And just barely she made it because we were not aware that she had been in such a situation. Now, we also think that if the person is in this with the good memories and so forth, and you've got a family history, particularly down the male side, it's been proven that if you have fa grandfather, father, and, and the person, the chances of that person getting back into relapse is much higher if they've got that family history. So that we have to warn our children that going to a, a college where there's drinking and a fraternity or sorority and all that, which is Vanderbilt, unfortunately, uh, you're running a risk of taking that first drink. We don't know how many it's going to take to go through misuse onto addiction, but I can tell you we've had uh, one of my patients had three young uh, grandchildren going to college. I sent them all a letter, and it's written in the back of both books, a letter to their grandchildren. Please don't drink. Your grandfather was seriously ill with alcoholism, and, and six of them went to college. Three of them ended up in treatment. So uh, it's a real deal. Now, it hasn't been proven for the female side, but we think it's the same thing uh, on the female side. But you get a, I'll tell you, a mother and father, both alcoholic, you've got yourself a totally different thing to try to help the person that's a, that's a product of that marriage that's uh, drinking. Uh, I know it's hard to uh, think of how to tell your grandchildren and children, but that's what you need to do. And give them a book. So here we are, the death toll of the opioid crisis mounts. Families are increasingly weaving desperate warnings into the obituaries of loved ones. They wanted uh, this person that got the legacy.com and other sources and selected excerpts from the obituaries of people who died in 2016. In every case, the families of these mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, sons and daughters, and even grandmothers decided to make their loved ones struggle with opioids public in the death notice. Uh, this is James B. and myself at the uh, Southern Festival of Books. Uh, James B. now is an executive in a, uh, a uh, hospice program in North Carolina. He's a wonderful guy. Uh, he's a strong Christian, and he uses his Christian faith and his experience to uh, tell others about his uh, situation. So something he wants you to know, 
that spirituality is an essential part of recovery. So let me read you what he says. Like most children, I was bright-eyed and full of love, purity, joy, and hope. I yearned for spiritual things and a co connection with others and the world around me. But life dealt me a few hands that I was ill-equipped to deal with. Searching for a way to cope, I drank to overcome my insecurities and escape the feelings that seemed too painful to, to face. You see, addiction is much more than just a physical condition of an uncontrollable craving for drugs and alcohol. It infects our entire lives. It is physical, emotional, and spiritual. Not only are brains damaged by control use, but our character and emotional life are destroyed as well. We become self-centered, self-willed, dishonest, angry, and self-destructive. This is a spiritual crisis. We are not meant to be the center of the universe and consumed with selfishness. We are meant to have deep relationships with others, to serve our families and communities, and be connected to something greater than ourselves. Addiction robs us all of this. And for a spiritual problem, you need a spiritual solution. When I got clean, I really had a problem being honest. But by following the guidance of other members of NA and through prayer and action, I was able to complete what is called the Honesty Project. I had to go 30 days in a, now, in a uh, row without telling a lie. Every time I told a lie, I had to start over. It took me many months to finally uh, to finish, but an amazing thing happened along the way. My natural, slow, my, my natural instinct slowly switched from a habit of, t of, of bending the truth to telling the truth. This was a deeply spiritual experience for me. I learned that I could change and that God would help me if I was willing to put in the work. I learned to do the right thing without expectation of reward. Some people automatically learn these things from their parents and uh, community, but I had gotten lost along the way. I needed help to get back on the right path. This is just one example of how the spiritual aspect of recovery has helped transform my life. It has given me a story to tell that I can help others, and that is why we wrote the book, The Craving Brain. It wouldn't have been possible without the change that's taken place in my life. And let's be honest, no one would want to hear the story if I was just an asshole and didn't drink anymore. I started to let that go, uh, take that out. But he said, Andy, you've got to leave that in because people will really relate to me because there's nothing more important for them to, to think that what I did and what I say is real. Now, that's all I have to say, and I'm open for questions. Uh, let's see. Now, one thing I want to make sure. We, we have all of this on our website and some of these blogs that we have written on the website expand what I've talked about. And we like the, I like the blogs because they're all edited by Barbara and, and we tell more of the story. And then uh, it's the website is thecravingbrain.com and facebook.com. We have a big Facebook presence, big website presence. Uh, I want to give acknowledgement to JKS Communications, Kendall Highnold, who's here. She is the representative for JKS Communications, who we employed to help us, there she is, to help us uh, market the book. And I think I'm here because of her. Whatever, whatever reason that I'm here, uh, I'm glad to be here. Yes, sir. Dr. Spickard, I wanted to know, is there a connection between bipolar disorder 
and addiction, and, and what is it? Uh, the, the question is, uh, is there a connection between bipolar disease and addiction? And the answer is yes. Uh, we all are acquainted with associated diseases with addiction, and bipolar is one of the leading ones. The other is depression, apart from the addiction itself. Depression, and the patients drink because of the depression. And the third is schizophrenia. Those are the three that we deal with, and I learned how to do this medication-wise. If the person is on medication for bipolar disease and someone goes to an AA program that doesn't believe in the dual diagnosis, that's a dual diagnosis of addiction plus bipolar, and says take them off of that bipolar disease medication, they will kill themselves because they'll take a, a, a road down real quick. As far as I know, and I honestly didn't take the story of my friend that started all this about his mental illness because I was not trained, uh, you know, asking a psychiatrist to evaluate this person. He was so well trained in his work and so forth, he did not, as far as I know, have any comorbid illness. That's what we call it, comorbid illness, dual diagnosis. Bipolar is the main one. And depression, depression is probably the worst. Yes? My question is about uh, some of us don't believe in God in a certain way and uh, I'm partnered with someone who's an alcoholic and she always talks about a power greater than myself for those that do not have a God concept. And your question is, how do I respond to the person who doesn't have a, a God concept and because the spiritual aspects of what I mentioned is so important? Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting that there's been studies on that, that people say if you were also addicted that, and did not have the God concept, uh, your uh, understanding of spiritual matters, spiritual matters, would improve if you were around somebody who did. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to accept it. You acknowledge it and hope that it will help you in your own l life. And uh, Bill W. had a big problem with this, you know, when he started the whole problem with, of uh, recovery, because it had Christian roots. And it, when he had the white light in the the room in the hospital, he said, that must be the God of the preachers. And he tried to make it a Christian program, and it wouldn't work. And if you know that the, the, uh, the God as you know him, or how power is the alternative for the persons who are not spiritually uh, uh, understanding like yourself, so if, you go, if you're an alcoholic and you go to the meetings and you join in with the others who have the spiritual focus like, say, James and I do, you stay with the God as you know him or a higher power and you can still stand around and do the 12-step uh, mantra, which is the, spirit, the uh, 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 God as you know him high power, and they will work just as well for you. It has to be something like James says, something more than myself. So I, that's not a very clear answer for your question, but there's plenty of people who get sober by going to meetings without a spiritual concept, and they're in 202 down in uh, 202 23rd Avenue North. If you want to go and get a better explanation of that, that's where you go. Yes, sir. Um, is anything being done to improve the training of doctors with regard to the dispensing of medicine? Because a lot of these opioid addictions start from prescriptions. I know in my own life I've had three times when the medicine was just grossly misprescribed. Once when I really needed some painkiller, I was prescribed nothing. Once when I only 
uh, I was prescribed 20 opioid pills, and I only had to take three. And the most recent, um, my wife was prescribed 84 pills, if you can imagine that, when she only really needed to take one or two. Well, you, you hit on a raw nerve for me because the training now of our medical school people <clears throat> for our young people is to remedy that. But the practicing physicians, <clears throat> excuse me, who are out there that did not have the training that we're providing now are still doing what you say. You get a root canal, you get 40 Vicodin. And you've got now uh, 38 in your medicine cabinet that's going to be used by your relatives who are stealing the drugs and doing what we just talked about. We are, yes, we are. Other medical schools are. But it's the young people who are getting, getting all this training now. But it's late for the older ones because they don't care about this. They just prescribe. Yes, sir. Do, do you find that there are more non-Christians or atheists who are uh, drug addicts than Christians? I haven't taken a, toll, uh, a poll, and the answer is no. I haven't, don't, don't know the answer to that. How close are we to a blood test that could determine a genetic predisposition, or are we? The question is, how close are we to doing a genetic test for the susceptibility to addiction, or a piece of your shoulder to put under the microscope? We're not close. The only data that I have already given you is the data that's been proven for the males in a, in a Scandinavian population where they put the males in families and proved that the person, even in a non-using family, drank as much as the one that was in the using family. All the male side, but the females too. Yes, who is next? This is about, you were talking about substance, <coughs> excuse me, substance abuse. I worked in the field of sexual addiction for right. 20 years mm -hmm. uh, in their offices. And um, in fact, the national or international headquarters are both here in Nashville. Right. And so uh, there are people who count that, that there is no such thing as sexual addiction. What's your uh, view on that? Well, I can tell you that they are wrong <laughs> because we've had a sexual addiction of uh, physicians in our training program, our treatment program. And uh, interestingly enough, if you do MRIs, which is magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging, on a person who's got the sexual addiction picture and show them pornography, pictures of pornography, the same places that light up, that will light up for the addictive alcoholic. It also happens to be uh, appropriate for a gambling addiction. So they show them a set of, uh, uh, cards or jute box, you know, where they're using, uh, not jute box. Uh, I've got an 85-year-old aphasia here. <laughs> where you put, and uh, yeah. One arm bandit. Yes, ma'am. Does marijuana is what? Oh, it's no question it is. The answer is is marijuana a stepping stone? Yes. We've had uh, serious marijuana addicts on our treatment program. Now I don't know that it's going to be widely uh, uh, active as a. Uh, addictive agent to all these kids in Denver, Colorado. And, but I think they're having real problems uh, in those states that have, have made it a m medical uh, issue as well as uh, recreational. I just think it's going to be very serious information. Now, uh, Kendall, did we put out the, uh, and we're going to have the, on the our website, the uh, Go ahead. 
mentioning the two articles on marijuana. All right, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll have the, we don't have those in handouts today, but um, we will have them on the Craving Brain website under resources. Drug-Free Kids and Hazelden have put out the summary of the research on marijuana. It will be on the website here uh, when we finally get around to doing it. Are there any drug therapies being explored for addiction? Good question. Are there drug therapies that are being explored? Uh, naltrexone is a drug that I used before I quit practice that orally is, uh, blocks the craving. If you give naltrexone in an injectable form, which is called Vivitrol, it's $300, but you take it every month, you can stop the craving for alcohol. So the answer is yes. They're working very hard on the nucleus accumbens block of the dopamine system so that if there is a medication, it will be in that range to stop the, the reward system around and about that I just talked about. We're just waiting for it. Now you have it, you know, for smoking. Chantrix that you see on the, I've seen a guy smoking three packs of cigarettes a day, take Chantrix and just stop it like a rock. So we have, uh, the pra prayerfully, is what we want to do uh, is, is ha hope that the research programs will find the answer to your question, which is good medicines that can be taken. And there are opioids that we can do. And you know that the Narcan that comes out in a spray, that if your kid is down in the bathroom uh, gasping for breath, on opioids, you spray them in the nose with Narcan and up they come. And at one of the uh, Texas... Uh, University of go, Texas... Go ahead and tell that story. We were, look, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal just a few days ago about the um, epidemic of opioid and heroin abuse on college campuses. And this Narcan that he's talking about, you spray it in the nose and up they pop course they're still got the same problem that they had before they were down but at the University of Texas at Austin at the front desk of each residential hall they've got it can you imagine we got into black you, have you gotten your Narcan spray today <laughs> unbelievable yes Drink our brainstorm. Start over again. Okay. What is causing kids today to steal pills from their grandparents? They're well educated, they should know better. Um, I don't remember this from when I was in high school and college. Sure, people, you know, we partied and drank some wine and beer and, and you know, maybe some hard stuff once in a while, that kind of thing. But they should know better. They've been educated. Why are they taking that kind of risk and what kind of pain are they in to make them do that? And can we help to raise our kids or help um, protect them emotionally from being susceptible to whatever pain is driving them to do that? Well, it's not the pain that they're, they're, they're thinking of the emotional high, it's called a high, that they get the feelings. They want feelings and they want something that will take away the pain that they are experiencing emotional pain perhaps in a situation like James was in. And the answer to your question is, I don't know. That's why we're here in a wonderful place where prayer is central. That's where we focus our answers because I can tell you nobody knows the answer to your question and we would love to know the answer. Yes. Thank you. Oh, can, I, can I say something before we go? Sure. Thank you. So Andy introduced that I'm with something called JKS Communications, which is a publicity firm for authors. So I like to encourage people to look at books and buy books. And one of the things that Andy did by self-publishing this book was it allows the book to be sold at $15, which is pretty 
extraordinary for what's in this book. If he'd gone through a publishing house, they would have needed to mark that up. But because of the way he did it, <clears throat> it's more affordable. And I just cannot tell you how this book has affected my life. And the fact that it is alternates chapters. So you have the story of James, and you see his descent into addiction, and his ascent into recovery. But every other chapter, you've got Barbara and uh, Dr. Spickard explaining from a neuroscience perspective what's happening in the brain when somebody is experiencing that. It's really powerful. It's, it's, I think it's a good book for young children as well. I mean, not young children, but you know, um, certainly teenagers. Um, and the last thing I want to say is Andy said um, very generously, oh, I think I'm here because of Kendall. No. I'm here because of Andy. <laughs> I was one of those nine grandchildren that got that letter before I went to college. And I kept it for a very long time. And it made a real impact on me. And um, so you can imagine how grateful I am. So thank you for coming for him. And I want to clarify, the reason you're here is because Ollie wants your expertise, and we want to thank you for sharing with us. Thank you.